Aryan Khan mentioning in a WhatsApp chat, let's do cocaine tomorrow. Shah Rukh Khan is at Mumbai's, was at Mumbai's Arthur Road Jail just uh, ten just minutes ago to meet his uh, son. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert and you're at The Listening Post, where we don't cover the news, we cover the way the news is covered. Here are the media stories we're examining this week. His name is Khan. He's as big as they come in the Indian film industry. We look at the drug bust that tells a story of the conflict between the authorities there and Bollywood. Facebook and the continuing fallout from that whistleblower, a consortium of news outlets, is now on the company's case. You're at sea. Alarm phone the hotline in the Mediterranean that refugees are using to get their stories out. And... Je scroll, you scroll, we all scroll. What's it going to take to get us off our phones? On paper, it looked like a routine drug bust. A group of 20-somethings partying on a cruise ship off the coast of Mumbai charged with possession and trafficking. It was anything but routine. Among those arrested was Aryan Khan, the son of one of India's and the world's biggest movie stars, Shah Rukh Khan. The circumstances suggest this case was never just about the son or the narcotics allegedly involved. The authorities appear to be going after his father, who is Muslim and belongs to a film industry, Bollywood, whose secular and liberal output conflicts with the ruling BJP party's Hindu nationalist ideology known as Hindutva. Aware of the film industry's sway on the masses, some say that the government has taken a two-track approach. On one hand, Prime Minister Narendra Modi makes nice with some of Bollywood's biggest stars. On the other, his government's anti-drug squads target the film industry, sending a message. Our starting point this week is Mumbai. A drug bust, alleged, on a cruise ship off the coast of Mumbai. Aryan! Aryan! Among the eight young people taken into custody, Aryan Khan, the son of one of India's and the world's biggest movie stars, Shahrukh Khan, who happens to be a Muslim. Actors are not actors, now they are the names of the drugs in this whole case. This is a big thing. It is a salacious story, custom made for Indian news channels that are themselves addicted to Bollywood. Bollywood ka ek aisa naam expose ho jayega. And the celebrity driven stories it provides that drive ratings. The details are murky and there's a larger pattern at play. The Indian authorities are targeting Bollywood and what the film industry has come to represent. These twists and turns in the case almost make it seem like, uh, you know, a thriller in which one new episode is unfolding every single day. One finds that there is no transparency in the way the case is being tackled. That is why one is wondering whether there is more to it than meets the eye. Many commentators have argued that it's Shah Rukh Khan who's the target of this case. But I would say that it's actually the Hindi film industry or Bollywood that has been targeted over the last several years by BJP politicians and their allied Hindu nationalist groups. So what I think the Aryan Khan case represents is a much broader assault on popular culture in India. The drug bust would not have made news if the accused did not have a famous father. Shah Khan is a Muslim megastar who calls himself an Indian patriot. In 2010, he made a movie on the demonization of Muslims, delivering a line that stuck with audiences in India and beyond. My name is Khan. And I'm not a terrorist. Khan is married to a Hindu and is one of the faces of an industry that celebrates and exports stories of secularism and liberalism, an implicit rejection of the ruling BJP party's Hindu nationalist ideology. Shah Rukh Khan represents an older ideal of India as a secular, multi-ethnic and pluralist nation. He's a Muslim who grew up in Delhi in really modest economic circumstances. He goes to Bombay to make his mark in the entertainment industry and succeeds wildly. 
And I think the very existence of a successful, popular, well-respected Muslim man challenges or threatens the Hindu nationalist ideologies that have been prevailing over the last several years, which are trying to portray Muslims as the ultimate other outsider or villain. I don't want to believe that that is why he's being targeted, but there is a rising sentiment of Islamophobia in the country, and it, it is possible. Shah Rukh Khan, what he says travels all over the world. It, it is heard all over the world. If given the option of controlling that, I assume anybody would want to. I don't know why people are focusing only on this party and this government. Since I was born in this country, I have seen every single government has intimidated uh, anybody who's against them. Since independence, in India, politics and Bollywood have had a very strange relationship. Politicians have used uh, film stars uh, during elections to get votes. In return, Bollywood stars take favors from politicians. It's, it's a dirty game, you know, and everybody is part of it. Shahrukh Khan is far from the only Bollywood figure caught up in an anti-drugs crackdown conducted by the Narcotics Control Board, the NCB. He's just the most famous name on a list that over the last few years has grown to include multiple actors, writers, and directors, not all of them Muslim. In fact, most of those arrested are Hindu. The first big drug-related case happened last year when an actor uh, called Riya Chakrabarti was arrested and she spent time in prison and then there were people also called in for questioning by the NCB for drug-related matters. The Hindi film industry is the country's biggest soft power in terms of dissemination of ideas and thoughts and messages. It, to me, feels like an attempt to gain more power. There were other actors like uh, Shraddha Kapoor, Sara Ali Khan, and the superstar Deepika Padukone also called in for questioning. Eight top entities from Bollywood are very much part of a massive drug cartel. That's the bottom line. Bollywood was being vilified left, right and centre as though it was some hotbed of all kinds of crimes and a place which was uh, hiding all kinds of criminals. When Narendra Modi's BJP first came to power in 2014, the party was more focused on the news landscape than the film industry. India has more than 400 24-hour television news channels. The vast majority of them are now securely in the government's camp, some for ideological reasons, others for commercial ones, or just to avoid angering the authorities in New Delhi. In 2019, when running for re-election, Modi sent out this selfie with a group of actors. Like many prime ministers before him, he was trying to cozy up to film celebrities and their huge followings of potential voters. But the BJP's pro-Hindu conservative policies are not an easy sell in Bollywood with its secular, liberal reputation. Those policies are far more popular with Indian news channels, which once again have the government's back. The dark and rotting underbelly of the Bollywood elite is falling apart and I can tell you it stinks. If you take out the media out of it, suppose media doesn't highlight this, then nobody cares. If those eight young boys and girls were caught minus Aryan Khan, nobody would have cared. Now media has sensationalized it. Itne varshon tak Bollywood ke jin naayakon ko aap asal mein superstar samajhte the. Indian television news media is a embarrassment for humanity. The biggest destructive force Today is Indian television news media. They scream and shout and destroy lives. This case, they have made it so big that I'm sure that even judges must be thinking in their mind, if I take this decision, what will happen? If I take that decision, what's going to happen? Let's call out, clean up and boycott the Bollywood dirt. What do you say? Why if you look at how media has over the past few years been uh, completely compromised, I see parallels because media and um, cinema are uh, two very strong mediums, you know. Uh, one is bringing news to you, other is catering to your fantasies. Sometimes when it comes to public figures, 
What doesn't get said is as revealing as what does. Indian actors have among the biggest social media followings on the planet, numbers that routinely run into the tens of millions. But if Shahrukh Khan went online searching for messages of support from within his own industry, he would find very few people willing to back him, at least publicly. That silence tells its own story about the hazards of free speech in Narendra Modi's India. Many Indians criticize Bollywood celebrities for not being as politically outspoken as their Hollywood counterparts. After the election of Donald Trump, many people were comparing how vocal Hollywood stars were in their criticism of Trump as compared to how Bollywood stars could never be as outspoken. But I think there's real consequences for being outspoken in India. Celebrities could get trolled incessantly, their movies could be boycotted, and finally, they or their families could be in physical danger. Even if political powers or government agencies don't come for you, there's also targeted online attacks, Twitter attacks, Instagram attacks that lead to loss of work. Not everybody wants to pay that price. Majority of them are not speaking. What that is a harbinger of, we'll find out. It just feels like another nail in the coffin of free speech. Hardly a week goes by, it seems, without Facebook turning up in your news feeds for all the wrong reasons. This time, a consortium of news outlets has been publishing stories about the company. Nick Muirhead has been following these stories. Nick, beyond what we looked at just a few weeks ago, that whistleblower story, why is Facebook back in the news? That whistleblower, former Facebook employee Frances Haugen, initially took her story to the Wall Street Journal where she leaked thousands of internal documents to the paper. Haugen has now made those documents available to a consortium of more than a dozen news outlets including the New York Times and Washington Post in the US and European outlets like Le Monde in France and Süddeutsche Zeitung in Germany. And what kind of stories are we seeing as a result? Well, much more detail, pretty damning detail, that Facebook is well aware of its uh, problems with misinformation and hate speech in the U.S., but even more so outside of the U.S. in non-English speaking countries, and it's doing very little to prevent it. Um, going back to India, in 2019, just before the general election, the documents show that Facebook employees set up a dummy account to test user experience there. That account was quickly flooded with no prompting, quickly flooded with pro-Modi propaganda and anti-Muslim hate speech. As you know, Richard, India is seeing an alarming rise in Islamic phobic attacks. Um, in Ethiopia, employees repeatedly warned that uh, Facebook was failing to curb the spread of posts inciting communal violence in that country. Ethiopia now sits on the brink of civil war. Um, and despite all of that, uh, the consortium has also revealed that Facebook dedicates 84% of its efforts to combat misinformation to the US market alone. That just leaves 16% to the rest of the world. And the US market only makes up 10% of Facebook's business. How has Facebook responded to these stories? Because they had to know that they were coming. They did. They actually tweeted before the newspapers released their investigations. And they said that many of these documents are being mischaracterized and that it's all part of a gotcha campaign. That's on the back of news that Francis Haugen is getting a lot of backing from some heavy hitters, including Pierre Omidia, the founder of eBay, who is a well-known and outspoken critic of the expanding powers of big tech. So yes, there are elements of a gotcha campaign, but that does not mean that the consortium hasn't exposed some bad practices, more bad practices at Facebook. Okay, thanks, Nick. Cast your mind back to 2015, the height of Europe's refugee influx, when more than a million migrants tried to reach the continent by sea. The global news media were positioned around the Mediterranean, filing stories from various borders, sometimes from boats. When the numbers dropped, most of the journalists moved on. The story then faded from view, even though tens of thousands attempted that same trip in 2020, and more than a thousand of them died trying. One NGO that refuses to let this story go is Alarmfall. The organization was set up back in 2014 as an emergency hotline staffed by volunteers to aid refugees in distress, not by sending boats, but by reporting on the situation at sea, by pressuring the relevant authorities to come to the rescue. But some of the governments that Alarmfall is dealing with oversee the border control forces that can be part of the problem. 
The Listening Post's Johanna Hoos now on Alarm Phone and its efforts to shine a light on what is still happening on Europe's borders. Hello, my friend. This is Alarm Phone. Yes, hold on, hold on, hold on. You're at sea. You're in trouble. Can you hear me? Okay, good. A sympathetic voice yeah. on the other Sorry, end uh, of the line. The water's coming. One who always boat. picks up the phone. 24-7. Okay, so you're, you're in a boat. Okay, I'm going. My friend, I need you to calm. My friend, calm down, calm down. Okay, okay. I'm going to need your position. Can, can you get me your GPS position? An emergency hotline that doesn't just offer a lifeline, but that documents, boat by boat, the realities of what happens at the world's deadliest sea crossing. Your engine stopped. Okay, and there's water, there's water coming into the boat. People are being left, were being, still are left to drown in the Mediterranean because of the indifference of the European authorities. Uh, and so by being a hotline, an extra actor in the Mediterranean on people's side, you're doing something that's practically useful to people. One of the functions of the alarm phone is precisely to have a vision of the world where black lives matter, right? where everybody counts, where what's happening in the Mediterranean is not invisible. It is very difficult indeed to report from, from the sea. It's not only the terrain and geography that makes it uh, hard, but increasingly so states themselves who are trying to obstruct such investigations. And that's why it's the role of NGOs, of Alarm Phone and others, it's crucial. They have a crucial role to play to tell the story of refugees and help establish patterns, help establish what is really going on. Very often, they're the only witness, the only eyes over the Mediterranean and the Aegean Sea. What really goes on at sea is something some European governments want to stay at sea. The influx in 2015 of more than a million migrants marked the height of Europe's refugee crisis. It affected politics and fanned populist movements across the European Union. Tougher, often less humane border policies were the result. Their supporters argue that those policies have worked, sent a message. The number of attempted crossings has dropped by about 90% over the last five years. Still, around 90,000 people tried it in 2020. Greece, which has borne the brunt of the migrant crisis, has taken a particularly uncompromising stance on refugees. Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis and his right-wing New Democracy Party came to power in 2019. NGOs, media and human rights organizations have since accused the Greek Coast Guard of attacking migrants pushing their boats and dinghies back out to sea. That practice is called pushback, and under international law, it's illegal. But when we raised that fact with the Greek Minister of Migration, he dodged the question and tried to turn our attention onto neighboring Turkey instead. Now, let me be clear. It is the Turkish Coast Guard that needs to prevent people leaving Turkish soil, reaching the Greek territorial waters. And let's also be clear with something else. Turkey is a safe country. And people fleeing Turkey are not fleeing a war zone. And therefore, it cannot be an excuse to allow people to go into unseaworthy dinghies driven by people with no experience at sea. And these people, sometimes with the support of the Turkish Coast Guard, end up crossing illegally. And some of them, unfortunately, we see loss of life in the Aegean. The Minister of Migration avoided the issue of pushback and his government's involvement in it, which is where Alarm Phone comes in. What can you see? You, you can see the shore. Yeah, yeah, you're really, you're really near to Lesbos. You're, you're, you're right there. The information volunteers like Jacob Bergson collect over the phone is passed on to news outlets that no longer devote the resources to the refugee story they once did. How many are on the boat? Okay. 23. How many women? 12. Are there, are there any children? Some major media players have grown reliant, at least partly, on alarm phone for their own reporting. Outlets like the New York Times and Germany's Der Spiegel. Over the past months, we have published a series of very well-documented reports concerning pushbacks and violence and violations of human rights. 
Uh, I believe very little of this, uh, uh, or maybe none of this, would be uh, possible to document, to produce, if it weren't for uh, organizations, including Alarm Phone. Their role is to collect raw evidence uh, and testimonies from, from migrants. Our role as media gatekeepers is to uh, collaborate with them, establish the veracity of what they say, and then publish. If the documentation is a necessity, when you see people on the move as people, then of course you document it. Of course you, 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 you write their, their tragedy. It's, it's, um, it's the bare minimum that you can do. And why do we collect and document all this information? So that when this racist system is over, no one can say, we didn't know. But the kind of work these activists are doing has landed them in trouble with the law. This past June, the Greek police launched a criminal investigation into Alarm Phone and several other NGOs, organizations like Jazur and Aegean Boat Reports. The charges? Espionage, revealing state secrets, joining criminal organizations and facilitating the illegal entry of migrants into Europe. The prosecution is not holding back. It tapped the aid workers' phones, put them under surveillance, and it even went as far as recruiting undercover migrants, putting them back on boats bound for Greece, all in an effort to prove the NGO's involvement in crimes at sea. To date, not a single person has been called in for questioning, and the evidence just doesn't seem to stack up. We asked Notis Mitaraki if this case against the NGOs is more about silencing those exposing government wrongdoing than it is about fighting crime. The government doesn't press charges. It is the judicial and the police that uh, investigate crimes. We're not against any NGOs. The villains here are the smugglers. And anyone cooperating with the smugglers, I haven't named specifically any NGOs, but there was a number of testimonies from asylum seekers that themselves identified the names of organizations that either helped them to fly to Turkey or would help them in the journey from the Turkish coast to Greece. This is deemed as a crime and it is the police and the courts that will decide. I find it very, very, very hard to believe that this will ever end up in a guilty sentence based at least on what I have seen in the police file. But I don't think the Greek government or authorities' purpose is a conviction down the road. It is to say that people who get in our way, these people uh, need to, to learn their lesson, uh, to learn their place, and also to uh, preemptively discredit their reporting, uh, because any future reporting that is based on alarm phone data would be much easier for the Greek government to dismiss uh, uh, as uh, propaganda by uh, NGOs who are already under criminal investigation. When you are on the field and reporting on this kind of violations, abuses, there's always going to be uh, pressure. Abusers will never want to be under scrutiny. There is no doubt that allegations of smuggling must be investigated thoroughly but one must make a distinction between those who profit from misery and those who are there to help. States have a duty to protect human rights defenders and not prosecute them. I'm going to call the Greek Coast Guard and hopefully they're going to, they're going to come. According to Alarm Phone, the real crimes aren't the ones the Greek authorities are investigating. It's the ones the state is committing. Try and keep getting that water out of the boat and keep, keep everybody calm, keep calm, OK? Despite the Greek government's attempts to intimidate, Alarm Phone is still there, at the receiving end of phone calls that may be the start of a refugee's new life or the last call they ever make, so that no one, journalists and politicians included, can ever say we did not know. OK, my friend, I'll call you in 10 minutes. OK, thank you. Spe speak soon. Bye. And finally, for all the scrollers out there, and there are billions of you, constantly scrolling on your phone, whether you're walking down the street, taking a bath, or trying to fall asleep. Here's a viral video by McFly and Carlito, a couple of French internet personalities, a reminder of just how dependent people have become on their phones. McFly and Carlito's videos are so popular in France that earlier this year, President Emmanuel Macron challenged the pair to produce something about COVID safety guidelines. It got more than 15 million views. 
Their Je Scroll video was at 1.5 million views, scrollers included, and counting. We'll see you next time here at the Listening Post. Chez le vétérinaire, je scroll. Dans le RER, je scroll. Quand je prends mon bain, je scroll. En cours d'espagnol, je scroll, je scroll. Quand mon père me parle, je scroll. Devant la télé, je scroll. Au mariage de mon pote, je scroll. Je mange de la compote et je scroll. Je scroll. Du matin jusqu'au soir. Je scroll. Debout sur le trottoir. Je scroll. Du soir au matin. Je scroll. Ah, J'ai loupé mon train. Je scroll, scroll. Le pouce est déchaîné. Je scroll, scroll. Toujours le coup penché. Je scroll, scroll. Je peux pas décrocher. Je scroll, scroll. Batterie déchargée. Traversant la rue, je scroll. Je me fais renverser, je scroll. Luxation du poignet, je scroll. Pas grave, je change de main et puis je scroll. Dans l'ambulance, je scroll. La famille me rend visite, je scroll. Ma mère pleure, mais je scroll. Mon grand frère m'engueule, mais je scroll.